Hi, everybody, and welcome to Taking Stock Live. I'm your host, No Montage, this evening. Looks like we're having a few technical issues uh, in this particular episode. My name is Kalila Runnels, and it is my pleasure to join you for this special edition of Taking Stock Live. We are super excited. By the way, how many of you watched the closing of the budget debate this evening? Let me know in the comments, you know, what were your highlights from Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark's closing of the budget debate. And uh, for me, definitely the issue about the 20%, the government is going to be paying 20% of your light bill for most Jamaicans. Not everybody will be eligible, but about 80% of Jamaicans will be eligible for this. Uh, I'm going to call it a discount, even though it's not really technically a discount. It's the government actually going in and paying a portion of your light bill. So this will apply if you are 200 kilowatts or less, if you use 200 kilowatts or less. But we'll talk more about that later on in the program. For now, here is, let me tell you what's coming up in this particular show. We'll take a look and we'll also give you what's hot in business. All right, so while I wait for the technical team to line that up, let me shout out everybody who is joining us live uh, early. I always love my early viewers, those of you who are already on even before we start the show. Is this it coming up? Jamaica's electric vehicle market is getting a jolt. Two Jamaican Canadians are launching flash motors to sell electric vehicles, service equipment and charging networks in Jamaica and across the Caribbean. And Wigton just bought up a 21% stake in the company. Talk about game changer. The flash team will join us to tell us all about it. And the analysts weigh in on the latest market developments. Now that the entertainment sector is back up, will we see a rise in entertainment stocks such as Main Event and KLE? Edufocal stock jumped 200% in its first week as a listed company. Why? And Honeybun is reporting a 31% increase in net profit for its first quarter. We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. Proven investments is said to issue two new US dollar bonds to raise three billion Jamaican dollars or 20 million US. According to a notice published on the Jamaica Stock Exchange's website, the bonds will be issued in two separate tranches. The first part will see secured USD indexed bonds of up to 4 million US being issued. The second part will be unsecured USD indexed bonds of up to 16 million US. According to the notice, the bonds, which are registered under the FSC exempt distribution guidelines, will be issued in favor of accredited accredited investors or those participating through the minimum purchase amount exemption. The cost of goods and services has risen 10.7% over the last 12 months. The Statistical Institute of Jamaica said this was mainly influenced by increases in three divisions. Between Fe February 2021 to February 2022, food prices rose by nearly 13% and transport costs went up by 14%. The category housing, water, electricity, gas, and other fuels was also up 10%. For the month of February alone, prices increased by 0.8%. According to Statin, this increase was mainly driven by increases in the category food and non-alcoholic beverages, which is heavily weighted. Higher prices for chicken products and increases in the prices of vegetables and tubers, such as potatoes, plantains, green bananas and peas and
beans were the main contributors. Increases in the rates for electricity, water and sewage led to a 0.9% increase in that division. Similarly, a 0.9% increase in the transport division was recorded because of higher fuel prices. NCB says it's closing four of its corporate area branches this May. According to the The bank, it's Oxford Road, Crossroads, Hadley Park Road and Washington Boulevard locations will be closed effective May 6. The bank said the move is part of its new branch model. The branches were selected because of the high density of branches in Kingston and the close proximity of branches. NCB said it will transfer for accounts from Crossroads to Duke Street Financial Center, from Hagley Park Road to Halfway Tree, from Oxford Road to Nutsud Boulevard, and from Washington Boulevard to Constance Spring Financial Center. NCB said it will still have a presence in these areas through the Bank on the Go facilities that will remain with the exception of the Oxford branch which has a low usage rate. With NCB's Bank on the Go ATMs, customers can check account balances, withdraw cash, deposit cash or checks, pay bills, make transfers and buy digital credit. However, for, for some customer service matters, customers will have to make an appointment to visit the nearest branch. In the notice of the closure, NCB also advised customers to use digital channels, including NCB Assist, a feature of the institution's personal online banking platform, or the NCB Live WhatsApp chatbot. The Central Bank of the Bahamas says international banks and trust companies operating in the country have more than two billion US dollars in custody or trust assets for individuals from or connected to Russia. The CBB said that following Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February, Bahamian financial institutions were warned against doing business with sanctioned persons and entities from Russia and Belarus. The bank said according to data it's collected, the sector held approximately 420 million US dollars in deposits and 2.5 billion US in custody or trust assets with ultimate beneficial owners from or connected to Russia. It noted that the greatest proportion of Russian exposure was linked to the international sector. The CBB said it is canvassing domestic financial institutions such as commercial banks, money transmission business and electronic money service providers to determine any exposure within those sectors. The U.S. Embassy in Nassau has urged the Bahamas to limit Russia's access to the Bahamian financial system and to restrict the country's airspace from Russian aircrafts. Consumers can expect five I have less Doritos in the bags, as potato chip company Frito-Lay says it's cutting down on the number of chips per bag. Frito-Lay, the manufacturer of Doritos, said it is downsizing the chips package to help keep the cost of the chips at the same price despite rising inflation. The company said each bag will go from 9.75 ounces to 9.25 ounces, a reduction of five chips per bag. Record inflation has led to an increase in production expenses for companies like Frito-Lay, which has caused some companies to hike prices. Others have decided to reduce product sizes while keeping price tags the same. Other notable American brands that have downsized their products in recent months include Charmin, Bounty, Gatorade, Crest, Wheat Thins, Quaker, Ziploc, and Dial. What's Heart was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. Our key word for 2022 is consistency. I've told you before that you can start investing with as little as a thousand Jamaican dollars, but the key to growing that into actual wealth is consistency. So here's what we're gonna do. Step one, open your investment account. Step two, set up a standing order or a salary deduction with your employer to fund that investment account every month so that at the end of each month, you have money to buy stocks. 
Step three, you're gonna watch my show, Taking Stock with Kalilo Reynolds, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. on YouTube for news and analysis on the stock market. And if you're completely clueless as to how to get started, will you take my Investing for Beginners Masterclass at kalilorunnels.com slash masterclass. 2022 is gonna be your year. Let's get this money. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. All right, welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we do apologize profusely for some of the technical challenges that we are experiencing today. We have some changes in the background and it's not working as smoothly as we would have hoped. So just uh, I apologize profusely and just bear with us. Uh, hopefully this won't be the case for the entire night and that we can sort this out pretty quickly and make sure that you have a pleasant viewing experience for the show. But we do have a very exciting show for you this evening. We are talking to Flash Motors. Now, Flash Motors is a company founded by two Canadian Jamaicans, Jamaicans who live in Canada. I'm not sure if they're born here, but we'll find out. And they have now incorporated this company in St. Lucia, actually. You know, just a lot of people uh, incorporating St. Lucia for tax purposes. It's a Jamaican company, though. Wigton Wind Farm has snapped up 21% of the company. And we're going to find out all about what they intend to do with the electric vehicle market here in Jamaica. So let me introduce my guests for the evening. Let's see who we have on. Xavier Gordon is co-founder and CEO of Flash Motors and Carrie Escoffrey is co-founder and CFO also of Flash Motors. Welcome Xavier, welcome Carrie. Hey, good evening. How good are evening. you doing today? I'm great. I hope you are great as well. So let me just put you side by side so that we can uh, see you a little bit better. There we go. Yeah. All right. So tell me about yourselves. Your friend. You've been friends like a long time. You both grew up in Canada. You grew up in Jamaica. Tell me about yourselves before we get uh, into the company. Yeah, sure. So yeah, Carrie and myself, we've been friends for well over a decade. Uh, we met during university years um, through an organization called the National Society of Black Engineers. I myself am an engineer, mechanical engineer. Carrie is not, but uh, it was a pretty <laughs> fun group. So he tagged along quite a bit um, to events and 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 uh, professional workshop development um, seminars that we did. Um, I am a born and raised Jamaican. I was born and raised in Kingston. Um, I migrated in the mid 90s. Um, around third form to Canada, um, and Carrie carries a carries a born Canadian, but uh, very strong roots. Both parents are are Jamaican. Yeah, no. Okay, that, so Carrie, tell me about yourself. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I mean, Xavier covered a lot of the ground there. Um, come from a finance background, um, but again, the National Society of Black Engineers was an organization that welcomed uh, people of all disciplines. Uh, born in Canada, uh, but both of my parents are Jamaican and have uh, you know very strong roots to to Jamaica. All right, so an engineer and somebody from finance, one with a finance background, one with an engineering background coming together to form this company. Is this your first business venture? Uh, no, not at all. We're both very much entrepreneurs. Uh, we have another uh, joint business uh, in Canada um, that I would say is kind of the impetus for our move into the Jamaican marketplace through Flash Motors. Um, and aside from that, you know, we've always we've come from uh, families that have been very entrepreneurial. I think that's that's had a, a, a great impact on our trajectory and, um, you know, has kind of shaped our direction. All right. Well, tell me now how Flash Motors actually came about. Who, who, whose idea was it? <laughs> so I'm, I'm usually the mad scientist in the group. Um, you know, in Canada, we operate um, an EPC company, Engineering Procurement and Construction, called Exergy Energy. We also do a lot of consulting. Um, and we deal with three technologies, solar PV, energy storage, as well as electric mobility, particular infrastructure, so charging stations. And we've been doing that in Canada since 2016. Um, around 2018, we came to Jamaica um, to really work with the public utility company to find out how we can accelerate electric mobility. Um, since then, we've done a number of consulting contracts all across the Caribbean, a lot in Jamaica. 
um, the public charging stations you'll see from the utility company. We, we do have our hand in, in a lot of that in the design and implementation of that. Um, but we've also worked in a lot of other countries, including Barbados, St. Lucia, uh, Guyana, uh, Bermuda, um, all across the region, really and truly talking about the gospel of electric mobility, helping governments and government agencies figure out how to pivot their fleets towards that. Um, and in looking at all of that experience that we gathered, along with our infra infrastructure experience here in Canada, we realized that there was an opportunity, or rather I should say a gap in the supply of a complete electric mobility solution, both vehicles, charging infrastructure, um, the financing of, of projects um, when it comes to fleets, both government and public transit. Um, and that was the impetus for, uh, for Flash Motors. So some of the charging stations that we see that JPS has put up, you guys are behind those? Correct, correct. Yeah, we've been we've been working with JPS since 2018 on a lot of projects, and that's one of one of many that we're working with them on. Interesting. All right. So tell me now about flash motors and what are some of the things that you actually before we get there, you said since 2018, you've been doing consultancies here in Jamaica. What has the response been like? Because I feel like the take up so far has been slow partly because of the lack of uh, vehicle access to vehicles and access to charging stations, which I understand you're in the market to help solve that problem. But I feel like there has been a lot of skepticism about this, uh, the potential of electric vehicles in Jamaica. So what has been your experience in the past three, four years? Yeah, what, I, what I'd say, I mean, a, a lot of it um, is really just misconceptions around the technology, um, you know, uh, in, ensuring that the infra the necessary infrastructure is, is on the ground to be able to support um, electric vehicles. And, you know, our first foray into the market was to help lay some of that foundation, um, you know, along the path that we're on now, it's really about educating the public. So we've really, um, you know, started to get messaging out there. Uh, to ensure that this is a transition that's going to happen regardless. Um, and so, you know, markets need to be ready for the transition. And when I say it's, it's something that's happening regardless, um, you know, several manufacturers globally have announced that uh, by 2030, they intend to only offer product that is, uh, you know, based on electric drivetrain. So, you know, our role here has really been to, um, you know, get the market prepared for that shift that's going to happen regardless. Um, and it's really, it's really, um, you know, subject to the education piece, ensuring that the infrastructure and support pieces are ready. Um, you know, once uh, the market and the kind of the global market for for EVs understood that some of this work was happening, um, it's really created a window to be able to supply the market, which is what we're trying to, um, which is what we're trying to do now. But have you sensed any reluctance on the part of whether it's the authorities in Jamaica, government, private sector, the public? Have you sensed any reluctance to step into this market? I mean, I would say that, you know, there's always with any new technology, uh, a group of first adopters. Um, so I remember back in you know 2017, Dr. Gary Jackson was one of the first persons in Jamaica who had an EV and a solar system on his house. Um, and, you know, those first adopters were very, very key in sort of moving the market along. Um, as we worked across the Caribbean, we worked to address some of those fears, um, things like reliability, um, things like supply chain. Uh, things like experience and that again is sort of is an impetus for what we did with creating flash motors looking at all those fairs and creating a group and an organization and skill set of, of people and products that sort of address a lot of those fears so for instance right now we have electric vehicles on the ground in jamaica we're doing extensive testing of them all across the island to ensure that they're ready for the jamaican market um, which we found has been a very key concern for people you know they're they, they seem comfortable with the idea of electric vehicles in other places, but they want to know, will it work for Jamaica and for Jamaicans? So that's part of the work that we're doing right now is ensuring that we are tailoring all of our products, both vehicles and infrastructure and solutions in general um, for the local market. And, you know, I do want to, you know, say that Jamaica is one of many markets that we're, we're working on. Jamaica, I would say, would be one of our biggest markets and clear, clearly the home market for us. But we have um, developments in, in the works for a number of other islands across the region as well, too. Yeah, just to kind of piggyback on on what Xavier's saying, um, for us too, there was also um, kind of a catch up that the product needed to make to be conditioned for the markets that we're entering into. So, you know, in the Canadian environment that we're in, you know, Canada has several EVs on the ground. They've been deployed here for some time. 
Uh, but the EVs at the time that they were kind of being introduced to this market weren't really uh, made for uh, the Caribbean climate. And so, you know, we've been really waiting for that technology and the product to kind of catch up to be able to land a product uh, in the region that we think is going to be successful given the specific conditions of the Caribbean. So tell me more about this product. What does Flash Motors or what will Flash Motors do and how advanced are you? Yeah, so one of the products that we're currently testing on the ground is from a manufacturer called BYD, Build Your Dreams. They're a Chinese manufacturer um, and they're the fourth largest EV manufacturer in the world by volume. Um, it's predicted actually by the end of the year this year, they'll be the number one manufacturer. Um, they've been in the electric mobility space and the battery business for over two decades. Um, they are supply major manufacturers, including Toyota, Honda, Ford, and Tesla as well too, from a technology point of view. Um, so we have their products on the ground right now in Jamaica for testing both in public and private sector fleets. Um, and again, the idea is to fine tune some of those products to ensure that they're going to be Jamaica ready for the retail market. So you're going to be you're going to actually be selling electric vehicles, yes? So not Flash Motors, our local partner will be selling electric vehicles and our local partner in Jamaica is the Stewart's Auto Group. Stewart's Auto. Okay, so a very, very large, very popular uh, automotive sales company. You have a, a well-known partner. So you will be sourcing the vehicles and they will be distributing them? How does it work? Yeah, ultimately, the arrangement is one where we, we kind of look at ourselves as a partnership. I mean, Stewart's has a long, uh, long history of uh, exceptional sales and service. Um, they have boots on the ground, and so they'll ultimately... Um, be offering the retail sales and service to end customers. And it's really our job to supply them and support them in the success of the technology and the vehicles themselves. So what types of vehicles and where will you be serving vehicles from? We're looking at the, well, everybody knows the Teslas. What's, what do you have specific brands that you're looking at? Yeah, so I mean, BYD is one of the first brands that we're introducing, but we do have some other brands that we'll be introducing into the market as well, too. And the product variety is going to be wide. Um, so we're looking at everything from subcompact cars all the way to luxury SUVs. Uh, we're looking at motorcycles. We're looking at commercial vehicles as well, too. Um, transit and luxury buses, so coach buses as well. Um, you know, we can bring the entire supply chain even as far up as electrified rail. Um, so it's one of those things where we're building a portfolio of products that we think will suit the marketplace and we'll be introducing them, you know, as as the market develops. Um, we're really keen on focusing on fleets and retail to start everything. Um, we also carry lines of charging stations as well, too. So the charging stations that go along with these electric vehicles, all the way from residential ones to industrial size ones, as well as the software solutions that go along with those charging stations. So, for instance, you'll notice with JPS and their charging go. Um, platform that they have a software solution that allows users to be able to access and pay for that service. We also carry a similar line of products and services available that can be used for private owners or private businesses. So, you know, let's say a supermarket wants to put up a charging station for its customers, um, but be able to recoup the cost of electricity. Um, we can provide both the charging station as well as a software solution to allow them to do that. So again, the idea is to be a one-stop shop for electric mobility solutions with a line of products that we feel would be really well fit within the local marketplace. And we're starting off with, with BYD. So we have a lot of questions coming in in the chat about this company and about the services. And one of the main questions is about the cost. So do you have an idea yet what the cost will be to purchase one of these types of vehicles? You said you're starting with BYD. Yeah, so we're still working through the uh, retail on the ground pricing with our partner Stuart's, Auto Stuart's Automotive Group. Uh, but within the coming weeks and months, um, that will certainly be um, information that's readily available to everybody. All right. And another question, let me go back to the comments. So I see Philip asking, like I said, everybody wants knows about Tesla. Are Teslas as they exist well suited for the Caribbean? And if not, why? Yeah, no, great question, Philip. So Teslas are, you know, top of the line, one of the best made electric vehicles um, that you can get. They have the full solution and they have everything that you could possibly want in an electric vehicle. Um, the problem is that Jamaica is not a supported market for Teslas. So 
um, the second a Tesla enters into Jamaica, it's a gray market vehicle and it's not supported by the manufacturer. So if you have any sort of issues, if you have any sort of software updates, any sort of recalls, you're going to have to re-export that vehicle back out to a different marketplace, probably Miami, in order to get that done. So we don't think that's necessarily applicable to the vast majority of Jamaicans. Obviously, some people have the means to do that. But if we're really going to get um, persons and, and the majority of the population on board with electric mobility, we have to find a product that's locally um, supported and serviced with parts and, and training and everything like that. So um, Tesla is a great, great product. Um, we just don't think it's going to be a mass market product for the Caribbean, unless, of course, Tesla decides to, to open up um, you know, distribu distribution into the marketplace itself. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're working with, you know, for instance, BYD is one of our manufacturers because, you know, we have the full support of the manufacturer, full manufacturer training, full access to supply chain, parts, repair, service, warranty, um, you know, enforcement, everything. So, you know, when we look at it from the perspective of, of a distributor, we're providing products that Jamaicans can rely on from, from, from day one. And just to, just to add on to that point, um, Xavier had alluded to it earlier. Um, BYD's battery technology is a coveted technology, right? People want to get their hands on the BYD product. Um, in fact, Tesla actually supplies several of its EVs or several of their EVs has are based on the battery platform that that BYD offers. So here's another question. Russell wants to know, how do you plan to attack the issue of higher upfront costs? Yeah, so upfront cost is definitely something that's been, you know, a, a big part of electric mobility being a new sector of the automotive industry. The scale doesn't necessarily work in the favor when compared to an internal combustion engine vehicle. But again, those upfront costs, that gap between, you know, a brand new electric vehicle and an ICE vehicle, internal combustion engine vehicle, has been shrinking quite rapidly. You know, we are targeting um, vehicles between the six million and, and fourteen million dollar range in Jamaica, which we think will be um, a pretty affordable place for that to be. Um, in addition, we also try to educate our customers on the total cost of ownership. Um, while upfront cost is definitely important for, for for affordability for a lot of consumers, we want to also stress the the operating cost of the vehicle. So as it stands right now in Jamaica, with current fuel and electricity prices operating an electric vehicle is one third the cost on a per kilometer basis. So uh, the more you drive, the more you're essentially saving with that. We also see a really, really good opportunity for fleet vehicles. So whether they're going to be taxis or public transit, um, that's a really, really big opportunity for making sure that electric mobility can actually reach to everybody in Jamaica and not just a few who own their own private cars. Right. It's right. important to note that the government is actually taking, um, you know, is, is putting their hat in the ring as well. And so yes. you know, it's pretty well known that uh, there has been a, a newly introduced duty structure specific to EVs in Jamaica, which will also help that upfront cost. But there's a limit to it. I don't, I don't think it went far enough. So what they announced a couple of weeks ago is that they will be reducing the import duty from 30% to 10% on electric vehicles. I'm not sure if it also applies to hybrids, but uh, it's only for the first, I think, 1,000 cars imported. Um, and I'm sure that you guys want to sell a lot more than a thousand cars a year. So, <laughs> so, so there is a limitation there. I don't know what's the current market like. Like how many, how many electric vehicles are sold in Jamaica now? I, don't know. I believe there's less than 150 overall um, mm -hmm. totality over the past few years. Um, a lot of those are secondhand used vehicles. Um, a lot of them aren't necessarily the best for the Jamaican climate. So um, I think that stock is going to get replaced pretty quickly with some of the new vehicles that we're going to be bringing into that. So obviously, we want to grab as much of that 1,000 vehicle share as possible. And we're hoping that you know there will be exceptions made for things like public transit fleets and for public taxis, judo taxis, et cetera. Because I think, again, not everybody in Jamaica has access to a private vehicle. We want to ensure that electric mobility the benefits of electric mobility extend to as much of the population as possible. So we do have taxi and public transit pro uh, products as well too. And hopefully that will also be able to be um, included in any sort of policy going forward. I mean, we did see the prime minister announce that they were going to take a look at the government fleet um, and see where the opportunities are. And that's certainly something that, you know, we have a lot of experience with. We've done that for the government of St. Lucia, Barbados as well too. So we're more than willing and ready to do that for the government of Jamaica as well. Right. So the six to fourteen million dollar price range is where you say you're starting at. And I think that is competitive in the Jamaican environment. 
Salty wants to know about after you well after you own this vehicle now a lot of the expense in owning a car can tend to come after you purchase the vehicle. Salty wants to know uh, what would the repair cost possibly look like. Right. So, I mean, operation maintenance for an electric vehicle is a lot simpler than an internal combustion engine vehicle. You don't have transmission costs. You don't have exhaust systems. You don't have a lot of heating and, and, and thermal management systems that you would need in, a, in an electric vehicle. So typically we find the reduction in cost to be around 50 percent, um, especially for the first few years. You're basically bringing in the vehicle for software updates. This is like a computer on wheels. Now, the biggest question we've always had is the battery itself. That's the biggest, uh, you know, the newest component or the component that that people are least familiar with, as well as probably the single most expensive component of the vehicle. Again, one of the reasons that you know we're very heavy on the type of products we're, that we're introducing is making sure we're introducing manufacturers that supply quality battery products, um, things that will last and things that are warranted. So for instance, the BYD product has basically a million mile, uh, million kilometer warranty on it. Um, you know, that's that's guaranteed by the manufacturer. So when you look at a million kilometers in a country like Jamaica, that's going to be, you know, being backed by the manufacturer for a very, very long time. You mentioned earlier that the the cost is about a third. I mean, the the fuel is not fuel that you use, the electricity cost uh, yeah. is about a third of what it would pay, what you would pay for gas. Well, it just explained that whole thing. So how much money would I save by driving an electric vehicle? How much money would I save by not having to, to pay for fuel, but I do have to pay the cost of electricity for charging my car? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've done some analysis. So for instance, we have a product there in Jamaica called the BYD E6. It's, a, it's sort of a, a crossover family wagon. Um, it's very comparable to the Toyota Wish. Um, you know, in fact, like I said, BYD and Toyota do work together quite extensively. So we do suspect they're actually probably the same vehicle skeleton. Um, but in any case, a, a Wish today, you know, costs about $12,000 Jamaican to fill up. Um, that same uh, BYD E6 costs about $3,000 on your JPS bill. So um, you'll be eliminating that $12,000 expense of, of fueling, uh, but you'll be increasing your JPS bill by $3,000. So again, it's it's quite um, quite an attractive uh, value proposition, especially when you start thinking about you know persons that drive quite a bit. This, but how long does it take to charge? Well, it all depends on how much you've driven. So, you know, the, the, the general behavior when you have a, a gasoline vehicle is you're going to drive it until it gets close to E and then you're going to stop and then you're going to refuel. Um, electricity is far more ubiquitous than liquid fuels in, in the sense that you have way more access to electricity than you do to gasoline or diesel. Um, when a car is parked, there's an opportunity for it to charge. Most of these vehicles will come and our vehicles will come with an overnight charger and that's designed to take your vehicle from empty to full um, overnight. So that'd be about eight hours. However, if you look at the driving habits of a typical Jamaican, they're not driving 500 kilometers in a day. And that's that's typically the range of our vehicles, 500 kilometers. They may be driving 50. If you're driving 50 or so kilometers, if you're commuting, let's say, from Old Harbor into Kingston and back every day, you might be doing 60 kilometers. Um, you would recharge that overnight in about two hours. Yeah, and just to kind of you know piggyback on that, I think there's there's a behavioral shift that's going to happen transitioning from internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles. Um, but it's you know it, even though it's a behavioral change, it's not something foreign. Um, you know we do it with our phones all the time, right? We use our phones in the day, uh, we plug them in at night, and we leave with a full battery uh, for the day. Uh, throughout the day, you know I know I walk around with uh, with my charger, um, and I top up my phone if I know that I'm going to be using it more extensively. And that's ultimately the way in which you will treat your, your electric vehicle. You'll plug it in at night. You'll leave on a full battery. A full battery will give you about 500 kilometers range. It's highly unlikely that you'll use that uh, 500 kilometers um, in a day. Um, in fact, Xavier and I just got back from, from Jamaica about a week ago, um, and we were able to drive to Montego Bay and back from Kingston. And so you know, the vehicles will carry you across the island and back on a single, on a single charge. Um, and so, you know, it's really just acclimating individuals to that behavioral shift. You know, you're not driving around until that yellow light comes on and tells you that you need to stop at a gas station. Um, you're driving, uh, you know, your, your normal route throughout the day. You're going home, you're charging to a full battery, um, and you have that full battery, um, you know, when, when you leave the home. And if you do need to top up throughout the day, that's the purpose of these, uh, the, the charging networks that are starting to pop up by JPS and other private participants. And you can charge at home. Is there like a special type of 
connection that you need or you can just plug it into your wall you can do both um, card, right? <laughs> to get yeah those. no you can do both. that's a great question you can do both uh typically we supply the vehicles what we call those overnight chargers and you'll get your local electrician to install that charger it's just like another appliance um, very similar to a dryer in a sense, in terms of electrical load. Um, and you, you attach that to your carport or your garage and you, you plug your vehicle in, uh, um, you know, when you get home in the evening um, and then you're, you're off to the races. Now they will come with travel chargers as well too. So these are smaller chargers that you could plug in into any regular outlet. Those are obviously a lot slower, um, but we use those basically any sort of like, you know, let's say you're gonna go visit your, your, your in-laws or your grandparents or so, and you're by their place, you may plug in um, just to catch a, a, a slow charge. But again, the type of vehicles that we're landing and that we're bringing to the market, um, there's gonna be very little need for any of that. Um, basically for most, I'm gonna say 95% of Jamaicans, you're gonna be able to just charge when you get home. Um, I know we have some more testing to do. We want to actually do a Kingston to Negril and back to Kingston route. Um, we suspect that we should be able to do that without having to plug into any public charging network. But again, um, both JPS and, and Evergo are putting up stations all over the island um, that we can access if we do happen to need a charge. And how long did you say it takes to charge? It all depends on how much you're driving. Um, if you're going to go from empty to full, um, which is very rare for an electric vehicle driver, um, especially in Jamaica. Like I said, these uh, vehicles have a range of 500 kilometers. I would I would challenge anybody in the comment section to say that you drive 500 kilometers a day. No, but I'm asking how long it would take to charge. So if I, I'm plugging it in, how long will it take? Is that overnight, an hour, four or five minutes? How long will and, it and, take? Right, and that's, that's the question that, I'm, that I'm, I'm trying to answer is that it really depends on how far you've driven. Again, you're used to going down to almost empty before you recharge your gasoline or diesel vehicle. So you're used to that. With an electric vehicle, you're not you're not going to be driving down to empty because you're parking your car. Most cars are parked 22 to 20 hours a day, and that's when you're gonna be charging. So again, if I take the example of someone commuting from Old Harbor into Kingston and back, they may be charging for two hours a day when they go home. Okay. No, but I wouldn't charge, like if I commute to Kingston, I'm not charging my car at work because most workplaces wouldn't have that facility. And then that would be a charge on, on the workplace anyway. They're not entitled. They're not required to, to help you pay your energy bill. So you'd have to charge at home, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And 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 so, yeah. So when you, you'd go, you come into Kingston, you'd go to work and you come back home. And when you come back home, you plug it in and it would probably only be drawing power for probably around two hours. Okay, night. so it's kind of like your your cell phone. You usually don't run it down for the most part till it dead, dead, dead. Whenever you get an opportunity, you charge it up. Yeah, yes, yes and no, because your cell phone typically is designed to last you about a day or so. Um, like I said, a 500 kilometer range for most Jamaicans, that's almost two weeks of, of power available. So, um, you know, you could you could theoretically run this car for around two weeks before you're really running into the need to actually plug it in. All right. And Dwayne wants to know about the mileage, but I think you answered that. It gives you, you said about 500 kilometers on yep. a full charge. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Let me take some more questions from the audience. I saw one earlier. Well, before I come to this, this question that a lot of people would want to know, and if you're regulars to this show, you probably kind of suspect what the question is going to be. But before that, this deal with Wigton. So Wigton Wind Farm, which is a renewable energy company, they specialize in wind energy. They have purchased 21% of your company. How did that deal come about? Yeah, so uh, we actually became first became acquainted with Wigton in 2018 um, on a Canadian trade mission that we made down to, to Jamaica. Uh, we did a tour of the Wigton facility. Again, Xavier and I, our uh, Canadian business uh, started in renewable energy technologies and storage. Um, and so we were fascinated with what Wigton was doing with wind and their interest in solar, uh, visited their facility. And I think we were really uh, drawn to the, um, uh, I guess, to the dioramas that they have set up, just speaking to and educating folks on uh, renewable energy technologies. Um, that kind of birthed the relationship with Wigton. Uh, we started to explore, um, you know, opportunities to start tying renewable power generation to electric vehicles. And that was kind of the birth of the relationship. We went through several iterations of concepts to start tying those two technologies together uh, because that's where the real value proposition is for a place like Jamaica, right? There's an abundant, there's a abundant power source in the sun. 
Um, and, you know, transitioning from, you know, fossil fuels to renewables um, is that much more powerful when you start tying it to, to transportation. So those early discussions on trying to bridge those two technologies um, and visiting that Wigton facility was really the birth. Um, and then over the years, as we started to, uh, you know, kind of spread our wings across the region, uh, realizing that Wigton had very similar uh, objectives to start to, to touch the region, more and more synergies started to, uh, started to uh, be realized. Um, and when we, uh, you know, did advise them that we were entering the vehicle space, they took a strong interest in, in being a part of that. So the follow-up question, of course, is, are, do you have any plans to pub publicly list the company to do an IPO? Yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's definitely, so as the finance guy uh, jumping <laughs> in, um, it's definitely something that's in the cards. Um, we certainly want to uh, you know, build the market and ensure that uh, we're moving in a direction that makes the most sense uh, for the company before doing so. Uh, but it is certainly something that is uh, that is in the cards uh, down the line when we feel the time is right. Um, but again, you know, being, uh, you know, with Wigton stake in in Flash Motors, uh, you know, continuing to hold uh, and own Wigton does give you, um, you know, some exposure to the performance of Flash Motors. Mm -hmm. What is your target for sales, both sales for cars and also target for having these charging stations up around the country? Like how many do you plan to have up and how soon? And then again, like I said, your target for vehicle sales in the first year. Sure. So, you know, speaking to, to the charging network, um, we're seeing a lot of private participants and the utility really fill that gap. Um, and it's really going to be our role to help support them in that. So we're looking at opportunities to ensure um, that those entities are successful. Uh, we have product that will greatly enable those charging networks. Um, and I think, you know, our last estimate that we would have kind of been, uh, you know, been advised about is about 300 charging stations across Jamaica, um, which would be more than enough to, uh, to support uh, the electric vehicles that are coming That's in. By when? So I think that, you know, the uh, last estimate was 60 by the end of this year. Um, and into next year, I think uh, the objective is to hit that total uh, 300 uh, target. Um, as far as electric vehicle sales go, um, I would say the full. I, I think the limit is a thousand, so I think we want the full thousand. <laughs> <laughs> so Xavier, so Xavier will certainly say the full thousand on on the cap for the year. Um, you know, we we you know this year is really about testing the vehicles, right? So we're not going to have a full year of sales. Um, you know, we want to ensure that the product is uh, is Jamaica ready. And like we advise, we, we intend to roll this out regionally. So there are other markets that we're um, that we're preparing to enter as well. But the key this year is really to ensure that the product is ready for the market. It's Jamaicanized. Um, and, you know, by the second quarter, third quarter, we'll really start to to ramp up sales. Um, a lot of it is going to be dependent on our vehicle availability. We understand. Um, uh, you know, kind of the nature of the market. Um, it's a strong SUV market, especially when it comes to, to new vehicles. And so we have some releases that will be coming out in the later part of this year that we think will be best suited for the marketplace. Um, but if I was to, uh, you know, give an early estimate, I would say, you know, upwards of, of, of 100 vehicles um, this year for the Jamaican marketplace. Um, and if all goes well, we'll start to uh, bridge into those other markets and, um, and, and actually have some take up there as well. Uh, by the following year, that's when we intend to really ramp up with a full suite of product available um, and ready for the market. And that's when we really get into our, our uh, you know, kind of highlighted sales projection. Which is and which other countries are you targeting in this early phase? Where else are you? Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're exploring quite a few right now. Um, a lot of that, uh, a lot of that work is in is kind of assessing where the market is, right? So, you know, we need to ensure that Infrastructure plans for infrastructure are there. Uh, we need to ensure that um, education training um, is ready in that market. And so we're kind of doing that analysis now just to kind of ready set markets and understand where they are um, and where there's gaps. Our first uh, foray into that market is going to be to plug some of those gaps, whether it be infrastructure or training to support the vehicles. Uh, once we do that, we are much more comfortable to start announcing those markets that we're entering into. Uh, but we are having those discussions now. Um, and we do travel across the region quite a bit to help ready those markets. Jamaica, of course, is um, you know has made several announcements with respect to the duty. Um, we're seeing infrastructure um, you know start to to come out of the ground to support EVs. Um, and actually, we're doing a significant amount of training on the ground to ensure that the Jamaica market is ready. 
Uh, and it's, it'll really be that same exercise that will apply across the region. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, guys. I wish you much success with this venture. For those of you who are just joining us, there's still many questions coming in that we have already answered. So when the video is done, you can just go back to the beginning and watch the full interview. But like I said, much success with this venture. And invite me when you uh, have your first cars on the island and you're launching. I want to be there. I want to test drive. Say no more. Certainly. That will, that will definitely be, you'll definitely get that invite. Awesome. All right, guys. So for those of you who are on, big up yourself. Uh, we appreciate your presence. And I want you to answer the poll question of the day. You can answer in the comments or you can answer in the poll. Go to the community tab of my YouTube channel. And it's actually not about electric vehicles this time, but you know we've been tracking the budget debate for you over the past couple of weeks. And the big announcement last week, Thursday, was the reopening of the entertainment sector. So how do you feel? Well, not just that, but the the abolishing of curfews altogether. Maybe abolition isn't the right word, but uh, the removal of the curfew. So how do you feel about the removal of the curfew restrictions and the entertainment sector being reopened? So are you saying, finally, time to do road chico last weekend? Uh, are you saying good for them, but I'm staying home? <laughs> oh, that's my answer. Uh, another COVID spike waiting to happen, or do you have another take on it? Take our poll in the community section of the YouTube channel, and you can also comment your answer below as well. Up next, we've got your market recap, and the analysts are standing by. Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Time now for your market recap. It was a bad week on Jamaica Stock Exchange, with the combined index down nearly 4%. 116 stocks traded across the main and the junior markets for the week ending Friday, March 18, 2022. 37 advanced, 69 declined, and 10 stayed the same. Nearly 229 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling about $1.3 billion. Jamaica Fiberglass Products was the most traded stock in its first week since listing. It took up 31% of market volume, with people buying and selling nearly 72 million shares in the company. The stock was also the second biggest gainer after Edufocal, up an impressive 53%. JFP opened on Monday at $1.53, 53 cents higher than its IPO price of $1. Wigton Wind Farm Ordinary Shares traded the second highest volume, taking up nearly 14% of market volume with people buying and selling 31 million shares in the company. The stock also rounded out this week's biggest gains after JFP up 24% to open the new week at 67 cents. This after an announcement that Wigton is purchasing 21% of Flash Holdings, a company which sells electric vehicles. And just like JFP, after listing of the JC last week, Edifocal rounded out the most traded, taking up 10% of market volume with 23 million shares trading. Edifocal was also last week's biggest gain up a whopping 205%. The stock opened this new week at $3.05. Its IPO price was just $1. On the losing side now, JMMB Group 7.5% was this week's biggest loser down nearly 24% to open the new week at $0.78. Cents. Cygnus Real Estate Finance USD is down 18% to open this new week at $0.13 cents US. And Mayberry Investments was down nearly 17% to close last week at $6.15. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Proven Wealth and Ideal Securities Brokers Limited. Welcome back, everybody. Notice anything different? Did a quick wardrobe change. Uh, you noticed I look a bit dark earlier. It's the white shirts. TV 101, don't wear white. And there's a specific reason for that. I should have known. <laughs> anyway, we are back and we have quite a bit of things to talk about on the market this week. As you saw in market recap, it wasn't a great week in general on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. But uh, for edufocal investors, it absolutely was a wonderful week up 200% and then some in week one. And JFP, to an extent as well, had its, uh, had its gains in week one too. So let's talk about it, among other things, as well as the, the budget debate today. Who do we have for our analyst panel today? We're joined by Senior Wealth Advisor at Ideal Securities Brokers Company, Dwayne Taylor. And we also have Assistant Manager of Private Equity at Proven Management, Julian Robinson. Welcome, guys. 
Hey, Kalilo. Hey, Kalilo. So, did you guys go out this weekend? <laughs> Negative. Uh, Who wrote? Who, which one? Which of you? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I went chat, out on Saturday. In the chat, viewers, do you think Julia <laughs> heard Dwayne went out? Which one do you think was more likely to go? Mammon is on Julia. Whoa. <laughs> really? Whoa. Wow, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Julia no. got jangas, didn't you? No, 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 man. Just <laughs> laying low. And I have an exam coming up, so I have to behave myself, you know? Oh, okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Dwayne? Yes, I went to Kalila, despite <laughs> you thinking otherwise. <laughs> See, prove me wrong. The Dwayne went on uh, and Dwayne and stayed home. Look at that. All right, so I can imagine, and I was calling uh, Solomon Sharp today from, from main events about an event that I actually want to do, and he didn't answer my call, and I, I'm thinking to myself, his phone is probably buzzing off the hook right now because everybody wants to do events, and so after that announcement, I was thinking, well, what does this mean for the entertainment stocks that, uh, pro that took a hit over the past couple of uh, years? Main event, Kingston Live Entertainment, um, those are first two that come to mind. Any, any more entertainment companies listed? Um, entertainment, pure play, not really. None that yeah, come to two, mind. Those two main no, 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 amusement. Tourism. Palace, yeah, Palace Amusement. Yeah, that's another huge one because they took a huge, yeah. huge hit, especially in 2020, and they still haven't really recovered. So what are the prospects for these stocks now? Do you think people will start showing interest since the sector is reopened? Well, individual investors might be taking some sector bits. I'm not sure of the risk appetite that's out there because right now it's a mixed bag. The idea is that we are realizing now more and more that inflation is entrenched, mm -hmm. meaning that it's not in fact transitory. And what's interesting is that developing countries like Jamaica with high exposure to the U.S. economy will be disproportionately affected because we don't produce much locally. So we don't have the advantage of import substitution. So it means that whenever supply chains tighten and the cost of inputs um, increases significantly, our impact will be significantly higher than if we had a strong import substitution base. So the long story is the outlook is changing. We're in the middle of a paradigm shift. So investors are starting to adjust their risk appetite in different directions. But I do think investors might, um, a few of them might be willing to take sector bets and bets on specific names. Mm. Are you seeing any of that, Dwayne? Are you seeing any, any early interest in these types of stocks? I mean, based off of uh, the index, not necessarily. Uh, as you can imagine, the index has been down a bit with a few players um, seeing an increase over the past week. Uh, I think with the announcement, we can we can look to see that play out possibly over the next couple of months. Um, and as Julian said, persons are prioritizing where, where it is they want to allocate their funds. The stock market might not necessarily be the ideal location per se. I mean, naturally we do need to have some diversity in our portfolios, but with inflation uh, on the rise, persons are looking for investment options that can offer them a safe, or a, a safe haven, so to speak, because you know with inflation, stock prices tend to take a hit. Uh, so right now, I think we're just in the early days. Uh, definitely there will be some recovery in particular for those entertainment stocks with you know the economy opening up a bit more for them persons probably going to utilize their services whether it be at the movies or going to an event so i do think that there is some uh, a positive outlook for them however we, we're still in the early days so it's 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 hard to see just yet so let's look at the two new companies, the two newly listed companies, Edgefocal and JFP. JFP listed last week, Monday, and Edgefocal listed last week, Tuesday. And their results, especially for Edgefocal, have been pretty great. I was trying to find where it closed at today. Uh, for some reason, I'm not seeing it here. Don't know where it closed at today, but I know on Friday it was up like 200%. So tell me, what have you been seeing with the results? Of, what do you make of the results of these two companies, starting with you, Julian, on Edufocal? Results, you mean in the price action, Kalilo? Right, yes. 
Okay, so in terms of the price action, it shows that investors are looking at the market for new offers. They're very hungry for new offers. We see that the, we've seen where the deal making environment um, has taken a turn because we've noticed that a lot of plans were shelved during the pandemic and many companies are starting to basically prepare for the reopening and with that in mind they have started to raise capital so many things are starting to come to the fore that were previously postponed and investors are anticipating this and this would have been pent up demand for new deals pretty much new avenues for investment and a lot of that momentum has been um carried carried forward and that is why we saw such strong price action on the stocks over the last couple of days so I just looked at I just looked up Edge of Focal's price and they ended today at three dollars and six cents. So right around where they ended on Friday, but it, they have traded as high as four dollars. So um, yeah, they they've been doing pretty well, in, pretty strong in this first week of trading. Dwayne JFP, um, they did well too, but because there is the the comparison naturally with Edge of Focal, some people might be disappointed. No. <laughs> Uh, not necessarily. I guess uh, as an investor, you know, there are participants that are looking to to make that uh, a profit off of, you know, selling on those shares. I mean, it's early days and we've noticed this trend over the years when it comes on to IPOs. The first, first and second week, there's going to be uh, a lot of activity in the market. So I think for those who would have... I guess cashed in, they would have they would have seen a bit of a profit, and that'll be good for them. And for, and for those that didn't uh, get the opportunity to buy into JFP, maybe there's some persons that had a keen interest in participating. They got that opportunity as well. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's bad. Um, obviously, Eddie Focal is <laughs> is on top for most persons. I'm sure investors would be happy to see the price that it's trading at, but. Um, I'm eager to see where uh, the market kind of levels out with, with the price valuation. Um, and I'm, I'm sure over the next week or two, we'll start to see where the true valuation for the company really lies, or if it, if it is to remain in the $3 region. Yeah. I think what's interesting with the moves is that for Edge Focal, the volumes have been robust. These moves mm -hmm. have not been on very small volumes within the context of yes. the supply on the market for Eddie Focus specifically. So it shows that the demand schedule is very robust. Um, and that helps. People are buying into the story. Investors love stories. Garden is a success story. Jamaicans love that right. he's a country youth that listed. He never did nothing illegal to list. Um, he played by the rules and he did exceptionally well. He's using technology and it's education and Jamaicans believe in the value of education for the most part. So. It's a it's a compelling story and the stock is showing that. Nice. Absolutely. So JFP ended today at a dollar thirty something, and then Edge of Focal you see here at three dollars and six cents. JFP went up to almost as high as two dollars and then started coming back down. So for those who would have sold uh, last week, like maybe like Wednesday, Thursday, they would have made a a decent profit. 75, 80, 90%, some even maybe 100% profit on on, uh, on JFP. Down back now to about $1.32, but that's still a decent profit, 30%. It's so funny that in our environment and some of the returns that we've gotten used to, some people could be complaining about 30% in a week, basically. <laughs> right. I think, the, I think the biggest issue persons might have is the amount of units that they got we we, we know both yeah. both ipos were um somewhat small i mean their junior market listing and it was somewhat small so persons probably wouldn't have got what they intended to get from it however 30 percent 40 percent it's still a gain on whatever money that persons would have invested into it so there are pros and cons to it but i definitely believe the pros outweigh the cons in this situation for investors yeah, and it's still a decent gain in a very short time because this has only been a week yeah. since these companies have listed. All right, so some companies have reported results, and I know you guys have been analyzing the latest results. Julian, you've taken a look at Honeybun's first quarter results. Michelle Chong happens to be one of my favorite people to interview, but I've never had her on this show. I probably should invite her sometime soon. Aww. So how did Honeybun do? 
Okay, so let me share my screen. All right, can you see? Yes. All right. Remember so, to zoom in for us because you might not remember. I remember. I don't forget all to tell you. In. All right. So uh hold on. All right, so so we're looking at revenues, right? Revenues for the period. Get rid of this. Yeah, revenues for the period um came in very strong for the three months year over year. Um, they're up 44%, which is a significant um, level of growth. Even if you were to adjust for <clears throat> movement in price, because we could say, hey, you know, some of that could be inflationary. They could be moving higher volumes, but some of that could be on price. Even if we were to factor that in, that's still a robust move, to say the least. Um, because if we notice year over year, they have beat their average growth rate, right? And that's a significant gap because the average growth rate is about 18% year over year in terms of growth. So 44% for the period is significant. In terms of profits, right? Their three-year average is around 40%, which is still great. Um, most of that would have been seen in 2019 over the prior period. Um, they had a modest year of growth in 2020 and another significant year of growth in terms of profitability for 2021. And that level of momentum was carried over into the first quarter of their 2022 um, financial year at 31% roughly. So we've seen where the company has been able to grow significantly, both in terms of sales and profitability, which is important because it shows that the company has some ability to contain its expenses over the years which is significant in an environment like this. Cost discipline is very important and it shows that management is being prudent. So we want to look at gross margins because gross margins tell a story of how well input costs are being managed. So essentially gross margins have been fairly consistent in 2019, 2020 and 2021. For the first quarter, um, the company saw a shrinkage in terms of gross, gross margins and that would have been partially impacted by the issues that we're hearing about. Supply chain challenges, thinking about um, the cost of inputs, dealing with higher energy prices, et cetera, feeding into those inputs, that is. So even though there would have been some reduction, it's not a significant reduction in that it's alarming. So the company is still being skillful in how it manages its expenses, even at that level. So it speaks to even inventory being managed carefully. And again, when we look at operating efficiency, the company has been consistent because they've stayed in the 30s range, even though there's a general um, downtrend here because of some of the challenges we mentioned. The fact that the company can be consistent is very important. So we're seeing both growth and we're seeing cost management, which is critical. So cash levels, cash flows from operations have been robust, which is good. So it means that the quality of profits is high because these earnings are profitability. These profits are bought by cash flow, which is critical because as we know as investors, profit and cash aren't the same thing. So that's very good and part of Honeybone. Um, in terms of the company managing its balance sheet, they've been building up their cash and bringing down debt, which is also a great sign. And if the company can do this consistently, it means that they can act quickly because if prices are rising, it means that you have less hurdles to clear as an investor. Um, or an allocator of capital, right? You don't have to be fighting over higher input costs, you're dealing with higher interest rates, you're dealing with all these hurdles to clear. The fact that the company has been deleveraging and building cash makes it more agile. So that's very important. They've expanded their distribution outlets to 16 total. They have been building out their machinery and their delivery vehicles so that they can scale faster and grow faster. So they can keep the momentum that they already have achieved so far, which is critical going forward. And they have making they have been making headwinds. They've been making progress in terms of their new products. So their shorty bread, the burger buns, the hot dog bun, which they have said have done extremely well in terms of their product portfolio. So there's innovation as well. And they have appointed their their successor. We can say it's a successor, a next generation to be exact. Daniel Chung is appointed to the board um, during the last financial year, which shows succession planning. So it means that the company is bullish, 
when we take all these factors into consideration, the company is forward looking, they're confident despite the challenges at hand. They want to improve they want to improve their export reach in Florida and in Canada. They have a loyal customer base and the reopening of schools should benefit them because not only parents will be buying these products for the children, but also the canteens will be stocking up, the vendors will be stocking up to cater to the school children who will actually be on the road. So we expect the company to be agile in the challenging environment. There might be some more challenges as it relates to their gross margins and possibly to their profit margins, but they should still continue, continue to see growth nonetheless. And it seems as if they're beating competition because their revenue and profitability is going in the right direction. But if you were to look at a comparable company like Purity, it's going in the opposite direction. So it could be that they're gaining market share in certain segments. Um, that's just an opinion though. But based on the data that is available, it suggests that that is what is taking place. So Honeybone is well positioned. In terms of the stock now, which are- You know, funny when you said a comparable company like Purity, when I, I interviewed Michelle Chung on Money Moves JA, one of my other programs, and yes. I asked her, who's her, who does she consider her competition? And she's like, oh, like Sarah Lee. And <laughs> so she's not even looking at Jamaica as her competition. And I love that. Yes, she's a visionary CEO. Mm -hmm. And that's, it really matters when you're investing in a company, you're also investing in the management behind that company, which is why I said she's a visionary CEO. These people are not afraid to take on new products, new markets, and also to face challenges as it relates to their business. Now, in terms of the stock itself, um, it closed at $9.29. And for context, it's flat year to date, right? But in terms of the 52 week high, it's down 23%. The PE multiple is about 19 times and the return on equity annualized is about 19%. So it means that um, the company is at a fair level in terms of its pricing. Um, investors can look at it. If you're looking at a longer time horizon over the last three years, it has performed at 140% according to the Bloomberg terminal. And over a one year time horizon, it performed at about 79%. Um, in terms of the pairs, it's about 17 times. We're talking about the pairs. So it's trading a little higher. But as we mentioned before, they're extremely profitable in terms of their growth pace. So that means that they, it's, it's understandable that the company would trade at a slightly higher valuation. In terms of where it was historically over the last three years, the PE is around 21.6 times. And the fact that it's at 19, 19 times now means that it could be an opportunity for investors to enter. Um, Doing preliminary calculations, I have a price estimate of about $10.45. Um, again, I'm not making a recommendation. This is just preliminary data that we have available to us. And that's my take on Honeybone pretty much. So, so that price estimate would be for, when do you think it will hit that range? Um, most of the price estimates are within a 12 month um, time horizon. So it could reach this level within the next, 12 months. It could happen before, you know, it's 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 hard to say exactly when. Yeah, I understand. But, That's right. the nature of speculation, but uh, <laughs> with, with knowledge, with analysis behind it. So Dwayne, <laughs> you were taking a look at the lab's first quarter results. The lab is just a spectacular company to follow their story as well. What are their, what is their first quarter telling us? Right. So I guess we can also mention, you know, another uh, visionary CEO as well in, in Kamala Bennett. But uh, let me share my screen so we can just jump into the financials. All right. We're seeing it clearly. Yes. Just zoom in on what you want us to focus on. All right. All right, cool. Let me oh no, let me go back a bit. All right, perfect. So, right, so let's look at the uh, income statement, right? So for operational for operating revenue, we saw that there was a 24.5 increase uh, quarter over quarter, uh, representing that 256 million to 443 million. Uh, revenue as well increased as operating revenue. Sorry, cost of operating revenue increased as well. Uh, this was largely due to you know, increases in staff costs. Uh, they've 
they've been trying to expand the company and uh, the revenue i'll just backtrack to the revenue just give a bit more insights on that the main reason behind the revenue growth was really down to the company improving on their core businesses the core business uh media placement was actually up 62.2 percent that represents a 93.2 million dollar increase and advertising uh, uh, revenue also increased 6.4 percent however their production um their production revenue decreased for this period now back in january the company actually made a statement saying that they're looking to implement tighter monitoring and control measures over their rece receivables i think that's what we're seeing reflecting now in the increase in their operating revenue now mm. when we look at the gross profits we see a bump up as well so despite the increase in operating revenue the gross profit has gone up uh that reflects roughly a 24 percent uh increase over quarter over quarter and that's a 27.6 million dollar uh increase now let's jump into the net profit so unfortunately this time around the net profit uh is a slight decrease um it's a 1.2 decrease quarter over quarter and this is largely due to if we can look at the finance income right here there's a significant drop in their finance income right and also also if we look at the uh, there's a loss for their subsidiary scope caribbean uh, it's not reflecting right here but they saw 1.3 million dollar loss uh for that subsidiary and for those who are unaware of the subsidiary uh, yeah, scope is that brand is, new that's their social media yeah. influencer portal right right so uh, i think i think it's fair for us to understand to look into the fact that the lab they are i mentioned she uh, kamala is a visionary leader they saw the need to create a facility for influencers for talent not only in Jamaica, but across the region. And as such, they're gonna have some hiccups. And I think that's why we're seeing that loss. Cause if, if that didn't take place, they would have been uh, in a profitable position. But nonetheless, um, these are the learning curves that these companies have to go through. And despite that, we still see where they're improving in other segments of the business. Now, um, I'm just gonna jump to the cash flow statement so we can just look at their position. So despite that um, decrease in net profits, their cash position is still relatively strong. As well, not even relatively, significantly strong uh, quarter over quarter. We can see where uh, their cash equivalents increased by 58 million. Um, also, if we want to look at their assets and uh, how they've been managing their balance sheet, I have to be going up and down, but bear with me. Um, if we look at their uh, total assets uh, quarter over quarter, we can see that there's a significant increase, roughly 37.2%, uh, which is roughly 253 million uh, quarter over quarter. So they've improved their asset position. I like the fact that they've also reduced their long-term loans because normally we want it we know we want to know that companies are you know minimizing their debt as much as possible you know, reg regardless of that increase uh, in their in their liabilities we want to know that companies taking the steps to clear off their debt um i would want to get a bit more information on their long-term lease if we can just look back at the financial for a second if you notice there's a huge bump up in their long-term lease agreement so i'm curious to see to, to get a bit more information on what caused that increase um as you know they've 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 delayed their annual report so we want to see what's going on and um we're thankful to get this information to have a picture of where the company is starting the year off but i think when the annual report comes up we'll have a clearer idea of you know the plans of the company what they plan to execute in 2022 but um, so far, so good. It's it's uh, it's looking positive for them. Now, I, my outlook for the company. Uh, I just want to let's share my screen again. I want to look at the stock price. So, if we're looking at the past six months for the company, the stock has been very flat when it comes down to trading. There's this one point in time where we start at 21 million uh shares trade for the company but overall it's been relatively flat the price has been trading within that three three to three fifty um three to three dollar fifty um region and uh when we look at the pe it's trading at 20 times 
you know, relative to the junior market, uh, which is roughly about 21, 22, I would say that the company is trading at a fair value. Um, with the stock trading so flat, I would assume that investors are looking to hold on to this company. I think a lot of us recognize that the lab is, is a solid company. We've seen them grow from strength to strength. And as such, I think investors are just using this time to hold on to it. And it would be fair for us to allow for 2022 to play out for them. I think with them revisiting uh, that, that uh, shortfall, it's called Caribbean and probably pivoting to see how best they can uh, improve that business. And also for them to improve on the other core business lines, we'll probably see a good year for, for the lab. But as I said, it's trading at a fair value. So I think um, for most investors, it's good to hold on to the stock and just allow them to grow. Right. Doing what is their companies to watch? Yes, Julian. I was asking doing to um, what was their cash flow from operations again? I know you looked at the total cash, but what there was a, what was their CFO? All right, let me jump back on that. Yeah. All right, cash flow from operations. Right. No. Yeah, they're actually up. Yeah, you can scroll down. Yeah. Scroll mm. down. You want to yeah. Yeah, up yeah, 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 yeah. Forty one yeah. million compared to thirty-eight. So they generated more cash for the period year over year. Mm -hmm. So even though their profit is flat, you know, they're generating more cash and that is what it takes to run a business. So to Absolutely. your point, doing you know, the company is looking good. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Dwayne. Thank you, Julian, for your assessment this evening. We always appreciate you guys. Thank you for having me. Right. Thank you. Take care. So yeah. we're going to take a very quick break. Um, take some more of your comments from the chat. And I have a little announcement. So stay tuned. The Analysts was brought to you by Proven Wealth and Ideal Securities Brokers Limited. Hey, moneymakers, you're not an official part of the family until you have your merch. Visit kalilorenolds.com slash store to order your t-shirt and your mask today. Let's get this money. I'm back. So I saw a lot of really interesting comments in the chat during that first conversation with the guys from Flash Motors. I'm very excited to see where they go with this company, uh, the launch when they have the vehicles here to test them myself. I saw some comments uh, about they're glad to see two black Jamaicans doing well. Somebody else had said, let me try find try bring up those comments. Somebody else said that these two guys are geniuses or is it genii? <laughs> oh yeah Duhin says <laughs> uh, agree but when we travel go country and the battery dead we don't have time to sit at a charging station so that's that's always been the concern about uh, people who uh, are thinking or considering about uh, uh, purchasing an electric vehicle how long does it take to charge but I think they addressed some of those issues during the show DJ Drumline said JPS bingo Oh, J oh, because people are going to be using JPS to, to charge their vehicles? Interesting. Um, Nicholas said, within two years, charging infrastructure will be locked in across the island, parish to parish. Let's get electric. Boogie, yoogie, yoogie. It's electric. Get it? Okay. <laughs> um, but, but they did say within about two years that they're looking at having a charging uh, station network of about 300 charging stations island wide, which should be able to support the market if that indeed materializes because there is private sector driven. It's not just them. You have government, you have JPS, you have various service stations that are starting to, to put uh, charging stations at their, um, at their locations. Uh, let me see. I found some other comments as well. People were commenting on the types of vehicles, Teslas. I saw somebody asking about Rivian and somebody else saying that Rivian is too expensive for the Jamaican market. It's interesting. We got to see where this is going to go. And I think the price point is fairly competitive for new vehicles. They said these cars are going to cost between six and 14 million Jamaican dollars. And in the new car market, that's probably about the price range, depending on whether you're buying a, a car car on suv or what type of vehicle you are are purchasing all right so let's come 
to that announcement. Those of you who joined my live yesterday, the interview with NCB Link, if you stayed through to the end, you would have heard me make an announcement saying that I'm going to be offering a special discount to people who use Link to purchase the master class. I still intend to do that, but I am going to wait until April 1. Why? Because April 1 will be the rollout of Jamdex. And I really want to start using Jamdex myself. And I want to encourage you to start using Jamdex. So I will be offering a big discount on my master class if you use Jamdex to purchase the master class. And I will make the announcement and the conditions and everything in my newsletter. So make sure that you're subscribed to the newsletter at kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter. I will stick to the commitment that I gave last night. Last night, I said it will be a 50% discount on the master class, and I will stick to that 50% discount if you use Jamdex to purchase the master class. And there will be a limitation on uh, time. So I'll probably do it, offer that incentive for about a week or so. But um, yeah, that's going to be the situation. Um, April 1. So look out for that. Look out for the details in the newsletter, kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter. Thank you so much for joining me, everyone, and for bearing with us through the technical challenges in the early part of the show. Fortunately, we were able to resolve them. Uh, I don't look blue anymore. The, the feed isn't lagging. It isn't sticking anymore. And we got through another great show. And I look forward to talking to you again next week. Same time, same place. Thanks so much to my hardworking production team. And thanks to you for joining me yet another week. Let's say it together. Let's get this money. Bye. Let's get this money. <laughs> <laughs>